would come come right in with me to Colossians. Uh, we're going to start a new series today. Not exactly how I anticipated starting the new series, but uh, here we are. And so we'll walk through the um, the book of Colossians, the beginning. I do encourage you to join us tonight for the live stream. We will live stream this evening service as well. And um, just ask that you use this day uh, to worship the Lord, to get rest, to be encouraged and, uh, and challenged. And so we're going to start right away and uh, begin in Colossians chapter 1. We're going to go through verses through verse 8 today as we discuss the, the prestigious faith of the Colossians. And uh, you're going to hear me use a phrase over and over again. I'm going to use the phrase, the preeminence of Christ, because it's really the theme of the book of Colossians, this preeminence of Christ, that Christ would have first place in our lives, first place in the life of the church, first place in uh, the priorities that we have. But Paul begins by giving thanks to the, to the Lord for the Colossian church. And it's a, it's a book of clarity, it's a book of, of praise, and uh, he praises them for how they live out their faith. It doesn't mean that the church is without problems, and we're going to see some of those problems. It doesn't mean that there's not fault or a need for improvement within the church, but it does mean that Paul can genuinely give praise for their faithfulness in how they love people and how they love Christ. And we see that pretty quickly. He starts with a formal greeting, so I'm going to ask if you would read with me, and we'll read the first eight verses. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all the saints for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven and wherefore ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel which is come unto you as it is in all the world and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you since the day ye heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth. As he also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. And so let's start with a word of prayer real quick, and uh, we'll dive into the Scriptures. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the chance to gather, even if it is remote. Uh, We ask that you would bless the time that we have. Lord, may this study Uh, challenge our hearts, deepen our faith in a way that pleases, honors, and glorifies you. Lord, I pray you'd bless these people today for their attention, for their desire to be in the word, and that uh, it would result in fruit in their lives as well. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, Paul begins in typical Pauline fashion here. He begins with a, an introduction, an introduction of his authority. And he's, the, he's not bragging. He's simply pointing out that he's been called here by God to speak on God's behalf to the Colossian church. And so he, he mentions his authority. And it's not his authority because of anything that he has done. It's because of what Jesus Christ has done in the past for him. So he says in verse 1, Paul, an apostle. And now that's a high term. It means one sent by. In fact, sent by Jesus Christ. He even mentions that. An apostle of Jesus Christ. But notice what he says next. By the will of God and Timotheus, our brother. So Timothy is with him, writing this letter, helping him, encouraging him. Uh, But Paul is mentioning the fact that that God is the one who's called him. God is the one who's brought him in. God is the one who's done this work, not Paul. And we know from Acts chapter 9 that that Paul very clearly was not not, uh, in a great effort seeking the Lord uh, out of his own ambitions. It was by God's grace and God's grace alone that he was even called. And so this is not a a high title that Paul is ascribing to or claiming for himself, this is a title that he's acknowledging God has given him. And so it's a a humble recognition 
that God has called him and God has gifted him or enabled him. It was God's mercy, it was God's grace that conquered Paul and called him to surrender to the ministry here. Notice number, number, verse 2, that it's to the saints, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae. So the, the second aspect is that this is written to believers. Paul here in his introduction, yes, he's been gifted by God. Yes, he's been called by God. Yes, he's surrendered to God. But it is, it is God's grace that has done this and, and gifted him. And he's writing it to the believers. Mostly non-Jewish, although there is a large Jewish community in the area, in, in Colossae. But it's, it's mostly, the church is mostly comprised of non-believers, uh, or, or non-Jews, I should say. A mixed people with pagan backgrounds, and, and that, that will crop up here, especially in chapter 2. It's also a wealthy community. They were known for dyeing wools uh, and textiles, and so it was a, a, a city of trade, of industry, and uh, therefore quite wealthy. And so Paul's writing to them because they have a strong influence or could have a strong influence in the world or a stronger influence in the world. And so he, he starts, though, in verse 3 by giving thanks. After that introduction, after addressing, it's important for us to understand who's writing, Paul, and who he's writing to, these believers that come from pagan backgrounds. It's important for us to recognize that because the application then is very similar to the application in our life. And so I could even start by asking with Paul here. Paul recognizes his calling is, is a gift from God. Can I ask you, do you recognize the gifts that God has given you, that God has enabled you to have? And the natural question that we're going to ask from the book of Colossians then is, in the giftings that he's given, given you, are you using them so that he has priority or preeminence does christ have first place in the use of your gifts today well verse three he starts by giving thanks he says we give thanks to god and the father of our lord jesus christ praying always for you so paul starts by giving praise to god thanks on behalf of these people these colossians by the way he hasn't been to colossia yet or colossa yet uh he is uh epaphras as we're going to see later has founded the church he has told paul of the believers there in Colossae, and uh and, and so paul's heard good things i think there's a good question for you and i there as well can we give thanks or rather can other believers give thanks for what they hear god is doing in our lives because of our faith because of our love can other believers give thanks? Can, can we say that others are delighted to pray for us? As Paul here is praying for the Colossian church, he's able to thank God because of what they've done. Can we say, can you and I say, that others are delighted to give God praise and thanks because of the love and the faithfulness that they see in our life? Paul can right now because of the Colossian church. But that's something that we should uh, seek to do as well. So they have a reputation. In fact, that's what Paul's going to really center on in the next four verses, the, the rest of the passage that we're going to look on. Paul's going to center on their reputation because their reputation is a reputation of faith in action. Paul's heard, as I said, he's heard from Epaphras. We see that in verse 7 and verse 8. He's heard from Epaphras himself of the love and the faith of the Colossian church. So their reputation precedes them. This rep, a good reputation of love. Fruitful actions, in fact. And he highlights two things. Fruit, fruitful actions of faith. What they believe about Jesus Christ, or we could say the gospel, is affecting how they live. So what they believe affects how they live. God directs and he helps them through trials. He's been helping them through circumstances. They have put their faith in God in, in difficult circumstances and trials. And as a result, others have heard of God's faithfulness. 
They know that they can trust the Lord for wisdom and help, and that is faith. They know that God always accomplishes His purposes. And God has been accomplishing His purposes and His His, uh, promises that He's given to believers, and the Colossians know that to be true. So they're fruitful in their actions of love. They, They have living faith. And that living faith then produces love. Notice again, the gospel is being sent out by this church as it displays love. He says in uh, multiple places, it's the saints. Verse 4, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all the saints so they're living out their faith their trust in god's promises before the other saints the other believers they're doing that first before they live out their faith to unbelievers and on top of that he he emphasizes the second half and that is fruitful actions of love they're living out their love to other believers or saints before they're living it out before unbelievers or people outside the church. Let's read verse 4 again. Since we heard, this is Paul and Timothy, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all the saints. And that, that must be true of our church as well if we're going to have a strong testimony. It must be lived out, faith in action, love in action within the church, the believers, among believers first before it can be effective to unbelievers or the world around us. And the Colossian church got that right. So they're fruitful in their actions. The the gospel message is validated. The message of faith is validated by their love in action and then sent out. So the truth, that's the faith, and the love of this church is impacting the world around them. It's being displayed within and without, which means there's no room for divisions. There's no room for cliques within the church. There's no room uh, for any criticism within the church or strife within the church, discontent within the church, self-centeredness within the church. All of that must be extinguished, put away, destroyed by faith and love. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22 says, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Love must be displayed within the church if it's going to validate the message that goes out of the church. And Paul praises the the Colossians for doing this, for for living out their their faith with love. Verse 5, he emphasizes their, their trust. Now, we don't necessarily see the word trust, we see the word hope. Verse 5, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, wherefore ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. Hope is not, again, we've talked about this a lot, it's not wishful thinking. It's a firm belief on the promises, a firm trust that God will accomplish the things that he has promised. That's the hope. This uh, great phrase would be confident expectation. With confidence, they fully expect God to accomplish what he has promised. And so Paul's purpose in this letter is to reveal that confident expectation, that hope that the Colossian church has, that Christ is sufficient. The all-sufficiency of Christ, therefore he deserves the preeminence. And so in chapter 1, Paul's going to declare the preeminence of Jesus Christ. He's going to do that, so the next three messages is all going to be on the preeminence of Christ and how Paul has clearly defined what it is and that it should have, uh, that Christ should have first place in our church but even more so in our lives. Then he'll defend the preeminence of Christ in chapter 2. And this is where the, some of the problems of the church begin to be addressed. And then in chapter 3 and chapter 4, 
It'll be the display of Christ's preeminence. And so Paul's going to hit this over and over and over again, that if Christ is your Savior, if He is my Savior, then He should have highest priority. And so these believers, they're endeavoring for Christ to have the preeminence. Let me emphasize that again. He's not criticizing the Colossians here yet. He'll, he'll point out some failures. He's basically saying it doesn't mean they haven't arrived, or it doesn't mean they have arrived. It doesn't mean that there isn't work to do. What it does mean here, this high praise that he starts with, this thanks, it does mean that they are striving for Christ to have first place in their lives. They know that Christ is sufficient, and they know that he deserves the, the highest priority, although the, there's always work to be done. They're applying Christ's sufficiency and Christ's authority, although there's always places that we kind of hide away and we don't give Christ priority. So the believers are living as a whole, they're living out an eternal perspective. They want to make their time here on earth count. Look at verse 5 again. You see it in the second, the, where really the first phrase, after the hope. For the hope, which is what here? Laid up for you in heaven. There's that eternal perspective. They have a confident expectation that their life here on earth matters for eternity. And they want to make their life matter for eternity. So they're living with faith and they're living with love so that eternity is impacted by what they do here and now. That's giving Christ preeminence. And Paul praises them highly for it. As I said, it doesn't mean there aren't problems. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8 says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of the world, or after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. So Paul's going to address some areas of concern. And they're areas of concern, as I said, because these are non Jewish believers. They didn't necessarily grow up with a strong uh, foundation of truth. They grew up with pagan practices and pagan religion. Uh, they didn't grow up in what we would call, here in America, we use the term Judeo-Christian morality. They didn't have that. Now you and I most likely have some of that. And so we have a foundation that's built into our very society that might be crumbling right now, but we, we have this foundation of morality and tradition, uh, godly tradition, that we, we already, we don't even recognize it, but we've, we've built off of it already. The Colossians didn't have that. And so Paul's concerned that they will fall back in some of their practices. It's called, theologians call it the Colossian heresy to fall back in a type of ecumenical, ecumenicalism. And just to, to give you the term, it can be a mixture of many things, philosophy uh, or, or truths that are diluted by man's thinking. Uh, legalism, we know what legalism is, rules and regulations. That, certainly the Jews uh, in, in Colossae would be a little bit more tempted to fall back into legalism than the believers. And we're going to talk about that even some tonight. Uh, angel worship, to worship other spirit beings that would have been a, a high temptation for the colossian believers to incorporate some to synchronize christianity with some of their pagan practices of angelic worship or asceticism and this is the one i think that might even be the most dangerous for us necessarily uh, it might be and that is that asceticism is the 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 doctrine or the teaching that a person can attain high spiritual morality through self-discipline, self-correction, self-assertion, self-sanctification. In other words, works. By the way, every religion outside of Christianity teaches works-based salvation and works-based sanctification. That, that is, that I, I am good enough for God through my efforts. Christianity even teaches, now true Christianity teaches 
that, that justification is by faith through Jesus Christ alone, not by works of righteousness that we can do. But a lot of times asceticism begins to creep into the church that after I'm saved, I can do enough good practices that God is pleased with me. Not for salvation, but for holiness. And although we have a responsibility to be holy, Christ is the one that must do the work in our heart. It's only external if it's our efforts. There must be heart change, continued heart change, if there's going to be growth. And so sometimes we can be tempted to follow this path of asceticism, of self-morality, and, and, and force God to be pleased with us through external actions. It's not necessarily legalism, because it's not for salvation, but it is a very rules-based sanctification. And Paul's going to warn the Colossians about the danger of that type of spiritual effort. And so the problem is the people kind of falling back into old habits. That's what Paul's concerned with. He'll address it in Colossians 3. He's going to use this, the term that we're probably familiar with, put off, put on. We're going to put off the old man, put on the new man. And, and that's all the practice of God not instilling in us uh, a set of regulations that, that override us, external practices, but an internal change that Christ accomplishes. And, and we need to... Uh, be yielding ourselves to that, willing vessels. And so Paul will address that, but I, I want to come back to first, uh, the, the first chapter, Colossians 1, because Paul is very clear to give praise, to start with praise. And he starts by praising their faithfulness and their love. We've seen that. We've seen how he emphasized their faith and their love and how it's in works, in, in fruit, not, not in works, but it results in fruit. We see that in verse 6. He says, which is come unto you as it is in all the world. So, so they have faith, just like the rest of the world, the gospel spreading throughout the world, but also on top of that, their reputation of following faithful, faithfully the Lord, trusting him with, with love, that's spreading out as well. And so he says, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you since the day ye heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth. As ye also learned of Epaphras. So there we have, he's the founder of the church, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love. Boy, what a great thing that Epaphras can, can go around bragging on what God has been doing in the Colossian church. That's essentially what's happening. Epaphras isn't doing it to pat himself on the back. He's not doing it to, to give the, the Colossian church false sense of, of hope or praise. He's doing it to give God glory. God is working in the, the churches here in this region. God is at work in the Colossian church. God is bringing about change in the believers and Paul hears of that, and he also gives God praise. So they have a teachable spirit under Epaphras, and the result is increased faith and increased love. In fact, it's a compounding effect. As their faith increases, they trust the Lord for more. They realize they can continually trust the Lord for more and more and more. It's a compounding effect. And the same occurs with their love. They show a little bit of love. And God gets the praise for it. And as a result, they show more love. And God gets more praise and more love and more praise. And that's what Paul is thanking them for, this continued compounding growth that they're having. And the fact that Epaphras speaks well. This actually caused me to really ponder something. I want you to think about it for yourself as well. I just wondered as I read that, do my interactions with people cause them to praise God. It should. Or do my interactions with people cause sighs of discouragement? I really don't want to be somebody who, as I approach, it causes them to uh, sigh in discouragement or fear. 
I, I want my presence to bring praise to God, delight to God, not a sigh. When people see me coming, I hope it fosters encouragement. You know, sometimes people joke with me. I, I'll ask, hey, can I, can I talk to you real quick? And we go to my office, and they always joke, oh, I feel like I'm going to the principal's office. I don't want people to feel that way. Now, I hope they're just joking. I want it to be a time of excitement for what God is doing, a time of encouragement, a time of praise for the Lord. And so Paul here begins Colossians with praise. He can genuinely thank God for the faith and the love that, that is going on in these believers. It, it doesn't mean there's, are, there's not areas for improvement, and he'll get there. There's always areas for improvement. But what a high accolade, a high praise that Paul, who hasn't even met them yet, has heard about their faith and their love. They're growing in their actions. And so I ask you in closing, are there areas in your life where Christ does not have preeminence? I think if we're honest, there's going to be some. And probably naturally, I'm not saying, there, I'm not saying are there areas that you won't give Christ preeminence because I think probably most of us would say, I'll give Christ preeminence everywhere. I'm asking one step deeper. Are there areas that you aren't giving him preeminence? Because you probably know the areas you should, but when it comes to faith and practice, sometimes we fall short. And so what are those areas where you're failing to give him first place? Let me ask you kind of a second, maybe, uh, again, help you apply it. What are areas of your life where you've built up habits that are hard to break, that hinder Christ from having preeminence, or rather hinder you from allowing Christ to have preeminence? Now, when I say the word habits, we automatically think of addictions, and I don't necessarily mean that, although it might be true. Can I give you some habits that I think often, more often, silently hinder Christ from having preeminence and we fail to recognize it. And their attitudes, habitual attitudes of maybe criticism or habits of apathy, just not caring about other people. And so it's hard for Christ to have preeminence in love when we don't care like we should for other people. Or cynicism or murmuring or, or selfishness and all of a sudden, life is much more about us than it is about Christ having priority. And so I'm going to encourage you now, as we close, I'm going to encourage you to take some time, even as a family. Now, Wednesday nights, we'll be meeting, Lord willing, no snow, and we'll be meeting to have growth groups. And, and we'll review many of these questions, but maybe you want to even take a minute right now with your family. And just review them with your kids. Just be a good time to do a good spiritual check with your kids, with your family, with your loved ones, with your spouse. Can you say that others are delighted to pray for you? Can, can you say that other people are delighted to have you around, that your presence fosters encouragement, not size? Can, can you say or can you identify some areas where Christ doesn't have preeminence? You know he should, but it's hard to practice that. And then what areas of your life have you built up some habits that are hard to break, hard to devote that preeminence to Christ? I thank you for joining today. I hope it's been an encouragement. I'm excited to get into the book of Colossians deeper, and I hope that today has been an encouragement to you, a challenge, yes, but also an encouragement. Join us tonight at 5 15 as we uh, walk through another passage we'll we'll walk through um, matters of the church out of acts chapter 15 and so uh, i i look forward to that can you can you pray with me as we close heavenly father we thank you lord we thank you for your goodness your love how tender you are in providing us opportunities to live out our faith and Lord, we all know, we all admit, there's times when we fail, we falter, we don't give you pre preeminence. Lord, how many times have we sat in this, this auditorium, uh, in, in this sanctuary, during church, and vowed that we would give you preeminence, only to leave 
and forget about it. Shame on us, Lord. I, I pray you'd help us to identify the areas where we don't give you preeminence, priority. Whether it be our speech, our, our attitude, our love, our faith. Lord, help us to be a giver of blessings that our presence around people would bring encouragement and truth. Truth that's received with love. Lord, we ask that you be honored and glorified. We thank you for the beauty of your creation, even displayed in the snow. And ask that you would help us to be encouraged, challenged, and grow as a result of our study today. We pray this in Christ's precious name. Amen.